fellowships and specific project man management skills for sale cargo <coughs> initiatives. Growing up just north of Kingston, Ontario, she began her sailing career with the St. Lawrence II. She then moved to larger ships, including Swan Fan Macum, at the age of 16. Founder of Topsail Rigging Limited, she has focused her attention in recent years to gaining knowledge of the field stage of large-scale projects. Most recently, Daniel has begun to work alongside Richard Tefson, Sailmaster BV, which is a uh, BV is the Dutch word for limited, in Harlingen in the Netherlands. Sailmaster is a company that builds and rigs tall ships and moves them, moves them from one location to another. They, they count themselves as the spider in the web that organizes and coordinates all contributions to a successful project. Please give Danielle a warm and show back welcome. why I wanted to come here at this time is to show you guys pictures like this um, because I thought it would resonate more strongly during the winter. So I'm going to go through this presentation. We have, I'm going to have quite a lot of slides but mostly photos so if anybody at any point really wants to stop me to ask a question please feel free to do so but I believe it's most likely better to take questions at the end. But in summary, I'm going to be telling you about how we're building a tall ship in Costa Rica. So here we go. So this is the vessel Vega, which is a Swedish vessel built in the 1900s. I think it was 1909. This is basically exactly what our ship Seva will look like. Except we will be about 15% bigger. Laid on deck. So you can see here this is a three masted square topsail schooner with traditional rigging and wooden spars. And the interesting thing about Vega when we take a look at it is that it's actually still uh, orientated or set up as a cargo ship. So you can see two cargo hatches in the center. So that's what we're trying to build at our so called jungle shipyard. Um, I think it's very lovely boat myself. So just going through, we have I have 10 different sections that I'm going to go through quickly, but just to give you a brief overview. Normally I don't talk about myself that much during these presentations, but I figured I was back in Ontario, so just give you guys a little intro again about myself quickly. Um, then our company mission and vision partners, the technical ship design, where we are sourcing and how we are processing the build materials of the ship, which is primarily wood. Um, and where are we actually talking about what's the location, what's our build site. And the launch method statement, which is kind of an exciting aspect as well. Why we're doing it, our cargo partners, and how are we being funded. So that's what we're going to cover. So here's the part about myself. <laughs> so you can see in the top there we have St. Lawrence 2 Playfair. And uh, there's me and my buddy Adrian Murray playing fiddle. Um, then we have the Tres Hombres, the second vessel down here, which is an engineless sailing cargo ship that I was, uh, yeah, everything on from deckhand to cook to chief mate. And then this is the Shabab Oman II, a newly launched vessel for the Royal Navy of Oman. And I was actually the first uh, woman to ever be signed on to a naval vessel for the country of Oman. Um, so that's just a little bit uh, story about me, and I'm coming from Perth Road Village, uh, which is near Sydenham, Ontario, if anyone knows it. The big ship, or the big photo there, is the Icelandic schooner Opal. So my company, Topsail Rigging, uh, did a big restoration and put all that 
do square rating on that, so that was about a three months job, and then I was able to do a delivery to Greenland, testing the brand new 100% electric engine that I was part of installing. I'm no engineer, but uh, so that was that boat was taken sailing, but that boat can also operate under 100% electric energy. So that's just a little bit about my background there. This boat I'm going to come back to later, but this was my first. Uh, day as captain was on this boat, and I'm going to come back to that in a later section. But this is the flagship of Barbados, Ruth, a very nice boat, also designed for sailing cargo. Just let me know if I'm also going too fast. I just don't want to get stuck on the slide. So the mission of our company, which is to build SEBA, is to direct the global maritime shipping industry towards carbon neutrality. So although we are building a wooden boat that's only going to carry about 12 containers worth of cargo, we're not trying to change the shipping industry to go back to wooden sailing ships, but we do want to inspire them to obtain a higher level and go emission free or at least make more environmental, uh, make environmental choices. So that's our mission. And the vision of our company, we will be a fully versatile, carbon negative shipping company, transporting specialty goods and eventually creating a fully regenerative system by combining organic agriculture, tree planting, shipbuilding, and cargo sailing. So what do we mean by fully regenerative system? That's beginning with right now with the tree planting. So we are using some of the funding that we have already and donated materials to plant trees that will eventually become shipbuilding lumber, 10% of them approximately. And because the trees only take about 50 years to grow down there to about this big to make a nice tropical hardwood, that actually outlives the lifespan of the ship, which when properly maintained can be about 100 years old. So you can see how the cycle is building and we can plant more trees and build more boats and it's supporting itself. So that's kind of the idea, there's like a bigger system behind it. <laughs> so. Moving on to our partners in the project, we have a number of partners. Um, the top level there of five people is basically our construction partners or our technical partners. Um, the first one I'll just go quickly is Link Skimond. He's my co-founder and he's a master woodworker. That's his private company. And we have Sigma Plus Associates, which is our uh, Swiss engineering firm, which will be providing all of the electrical engine setup and everything for us. That's my company there, Top Silvergy. And our naval architect for the design of the vessel is the Villiers Van Schaik, previously Manta Marine Design from the Netherlands. And this is interesting, this is a Haida Gwaii sustainable um, forestry company uh, that we've begun working with. And they are the only Aboriginal owned logging company in Canada. And we're working with them to source our masks, which Everybody knows should be British Columbia Douglas fir. <laughs> so everything else we're pretty sure will come directly from Costa Rica. All the lumber will be sustainably sourced from within the country, except for the masks. So it's kind of like a, you know, we need those British BC Douglas firs. Uh, a number of our other project our partners there are some different cargo and environmentally oriented uh, companies to do with sailing. Um, and as well we have a whole number of tree planting organizations we work with to maintain that not only are we planting trees but that we are sourcing trees sustainably because you got to be careful when you're taking a bulldozer into the jungle it could be good or bad <laughs> especially it could look good or bad you have to be very careful which species of tree you're taking and making sure that you are doing it in a sustainable manner and just down there at the bottom we were recently admitted to the Royal Naval Architect Society, I believe it's called, RENA, in England. And we were also, our company was awarded the chance to present at COP23, which is the United Nations Conference on Climate Change, this year in Germany. So we actually presented twice there, uh, which was pretty cool. And these are some upcoming ones that I just listed, which I realize I probably should have just taken down. But they are happening right now. We're winning different awards and different chances to present around the world. The crazy Dutch one, uh, Nederland Verpedrijf, is that we've just been recently accredited as a learning institution. Our shipyard is now an accredited institution. 
So, yeah, we are having Dutch, intern, Dutch shipbuilding interns come. That's a new thing. And that's just a little photo of one of our sustainable tree sourcing missions in the cloud forest of Costa Rica. Has anybody happened to been to Costa Rica or to Monte Verde? Yeah? Nice. So you can imagine that it's one of the most beautiful forests in the world, and the last thing we would want to do is take away from that. <laughs> So, but this is a tree that was standing dead uh, next to a building, and there's a lot of high winds there, so they always need them, you know, forestry management. So this was taken down, and if we, we often get the chance people say, hey, if you come take this tree down for us, you can have the wood. So that's what normally happens. So this is actually a mystery hardwood, and we do work with the local university and with the Monteverde Institute to, to identify all the trees. However, just on this little mountain top, this cloud forest, there are over 800 species of trees. And if you don't have the leaves, for example, this tree is already dead, it can be impossible to identify it. So this is a mystery hardwood. It's being used in shipyard structures, not in the vessel itself. But you can see the Alaskan mill set up there that we're using in the forest. Okay. Are there any questions so far about what I've said? Besides okay. Douglas Fir, for the scars or for the shipbuilding? We'll get to that then. There's a whole section on it. So this is just the design of our ship. So we are working with the naval architect for Pine Gun Ship, who's from the Netherlands. Uh, it's now tied with the New Zealand company. But this is basically what the ship will look like. Uh, he provided me with new drawings while I was on the plane yesterday. So we have some new renderings here that have never been published. So you can see the two cargo hatches there, and we have a raised forecastle. And so this vessel is primarily going to be mostly in temperate waters or tropical waters. We will be coming up to British Columbia twice a year, but at least once of those times it will be in the summer months. So it is designed primarily as a warmer weather vessel, although I've mentioned to it a number of times hey, I probably want to sail around the Horn, or we most likely will go up to Alaska, so it needs to be up to ice classification, just in case. But the actual layout of the boat is mostly designed for temperate temperatures. We have a couple of different sides here. That's showing the cargo holds. Basically there with some more coming up. So you can see there's a raised galley forward which is kind of really nice to get a lot of airflow. And the navigation station will be aft. This is still a work in progress, but we're pretty much getting there at this point. We have all the um, like dimensions of the ship ready, so that's why we're already able to start milling everything. But the little things like, oh, where will the store go? We're still playing with some of that stuff. And although it looks quite white and boring here, it will all be those tropical hardwoods. Mostly varnished, I think, but not everything. Again, it will be in the sun. This is showing our twin propellers and the engine here and there. So this will have, that's where the 100% electric engine will be. And the battery banks, I believe, will also be in there, but I don't think they're actually shown right there. But the battery banks, because they're quite large and quite heavy, will be out, but in the cargo hold, low down. We still actually adds like a little bit of ballast. Um, but we have the twin propellers because on the old call, the first big picture I showed you, they experience quite a bit of turbulence. So this propeller actually turns when you're sailing and charges the battery bank. So we convert kinetic energy to stored electric energy so we can drive the ship whenever we want. But even when there's no wind. But they've experienced a lot of turbulence. And so one way to counter that when you're steering the rudder, so what, a way to counter that was to go twin screw, so your rudder has clear flow. Mike, can you pedal the propellers once the batteries in charge? Yes, absolutely, yeah. So on the Opal, we had that, it was an incredible propeller, I think it was about $250,000. Repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I should repeat the question. The propeller can feather. So when we're sailing, to optimize, and, we don't, and if we don't need to charge, we can turn the propeller so it's in line with how we're sailing. So it will not slow us down or detract at that point. So that's the 
That's the design. So I kind of breeze through the design there. Were there any questions about the technical aspect of the design? Again, we'll get to wood, types of wood in a second. Yeah? What kind of packing cargo would you put it in? You put the containers, right? That's right. No, we can't put containers in. But we can't put normal 20 foot or 40 foot containers in, but we can put pallets, barrels, sacks and aeronautical containers, so airplane containers. So, okay, this is the, one of the parts that I'm most excited about, especially because it's what we're doing most actively right now, sourcing and processing shipbuilding materials. So this photo was actually published in a couple of magazines, including the Caribbean Compass, and I believe Marlin's Pipe magazine, or at least the next couple of photos we see have been published in magazines around the world, including Chasse Marais in France, and um, I forget, but another one. Oh, in England as well. So this is a cedro amargo, or a Spanish cedar. The Latin name is cedrella odorata. And those names basically mean bitter or sour cedar, which part of that is very true. It is very bitter. <laughs> if you get the dust on you, it tastes terrible. But it's not a cedar. It's not a true cedar. It's actually in the mahogany family. And it's a true mahogany, and it's just a little bit harder than the normal mahogany. So we recently cut down um, 24 live, healthy trees that were 50 years old, but that big. We have environmental permits for each one of them, and we know the son of the guy whose father planted them 50 years ago. And the interesting thing in Costa Rica is that forestry is a very big deal. They have one of the only countries in the world that the forest is growing every year. They plant, they pay people to take care of their trees, and they like to convert pastures such as cow fields, which may not be sustainable, back into secondary planted forests, which this is. So 50 years ago, this was a cow field. And the farmer had some foresight and said, I'm going to plant trees, bring the forest back here, and then 50 years from now, some of them will be able to provide new income. So as you can see, we're not clear cutting in any way. We just cut, we cut down 24 trees, and we've already planted over 1,000 to make up for that. But uh, it was an incredible day working with the team of Coast Rica Lumberjacks. Learned a lot. So this is, I was right there to all these photos. And uh, how they get the truck in. So they don't have a very big loader, but you can see they have to load the trees really quite high. So what they do is they just dug a little place that big and back Mac truck the truck in and it was like prime loading the way they I'd never seen anything like it working with these guys. It was really incredible. Like cow cowboys, you know. But so those are all Spanish cedar. And these Spanish cedars are going to be the frames, most of the frames of the boat, and the deck beams. Or the ribs and the deck beams. Um, it's not the hardest wood in the world. If you know mahogany, so you know that it's fairly hard, but it's not the densest. But it's extremely rot and gun resistant. Because it is so bitter, nothing will eat it. Yeah. And if every every couple of frames and every couple of deck beams, we're going to be putting in an extremely hard hardwood that we have access to, that's less rot resistant, but much denser. So. So this is an unedited photo. Um, you can see the bright color. You can see the chainsaw. Everyone knows the color of the Husqvarna chainsaw. But that's the color of the wood. It is so bright and so beautiful, rich color there. So that's on the shipyard taken a couple months ago. And that's an average size of the tree we have there. So we get some very big size. And again, it's only 50 years old because they have a full year to grow. Where in Canada, we only have half a year to grow or less. So we grow quickly. Um, just another shot from the shipyard. Those are deck beams. So the deck beams are eight inches wow. wide, or tall, sorry, and eight meters long. And the frames are six and a half inches width. And they'll be double up frames, double sawn frames. So, yeah, we get the backhoe in there probably once a month to help us dig some holes when the volunteers are getting tired. <laughs> and to help lift these things. Eventually we might get our own, but this is working for now. This was taken two days ago, uh, before I came here. This is milling up the other type of wood we have, which is Tamarindo del Monte, or I'm not gonna say this right, 
Dallium Guianese is the Latin name. <laughs> and it's uh, generally in English referred to as an ironwood. And if you know about woods, it can be kind of comparable to green, green heart, sort of. So that's going to be our keel. And that's what we're going to make every, you know, a couple frames and decades out of. So it's extremely dense. Uh, we did have a sawmill, portable sawmill on the site to mill up the Spanish cedars. Um, but we had some smaller pieces of this, and we, yeah, they couldn't cut it at all. There was no chance. So just the, the sawyers, like the jungle lumberjacks, the team, they said, yeah, we, we can't cut this. <laughs> so we bought them these special carbide blades, really very, very, very hard blades to be able to cut it. And we said, look, we're just giving this to you. You can keep these blades for the big sawmill. Can you cut this wood for us? And we're like, yeah, okay. And they ran it through once, and it was dull. Oh. And they said, yeah, we can't. We can't do this to our machine. So technically, it did cut it once, the brand new carbide blades, but that was it. So we have to use the chainsaw for everything. Um, you can see the Alaskan sawmill there. And yeah, that was the first cut opening up one of these guys. This is a 14-meter log. They, they, uh, they had to cut it to fill the truck, which really broke my heart, but it was longer. This tree was also very, was much more environmentally friendly sourced. It was brought down by Hurricane Otto in October 2016. Hurricane Otto hit Costa Rica in the north and really destroyed a lot of the country and ripped down many of these trees. We're going to be getting more. Um, so it's wind fallen. <laughs> it's more like hurricane ripped down. But it's interesting because it was the only hurricane in the history of the country to ever make landfall, ever recorded. So you can imagine that that held some significance for us to have the keel of our ship be from an environmental disaster. It's kind of, you know, showing that climate change is having some real effect. Today, actually, the team is going up to a little town called Guasimal, which is on the road to Monteverde, and getting some more Spanish cedars. And they are from the very recent tropical storm, which later turned into Hurricane Nate, that flooded all the rivers, took out all the bridges, destroyed a lot of houses in my area, and ripped out whole big trees just as big as the one you saw. And they're all laying in the riverbed now. It's really crazy. So they are getting a bulldozer and getting those out. The money for those trees goes to the people who lost their homes. And that's what we're getting there. But it's kind of significant for us because that's two years in a row. Basically, the hurricane is hit in Costa Rica, and there had never been one on record ever before. So it's giving me some emotional significance to the types of work we're doing to the boat. Yeah, you can see the size of that. That's a giant Italian guy, so that gives you some sense of scale. <laughs> He's 6'4". <six four. laughs> so that's some of our new interns. We had about six people show up the week before I came here. So I was running around trying to get them all sorted and everything and he likes to go barefoot but only when he's using a broom I said if you're using a chainsaw got some shoes on <laughs> yeah no that's only he's sweeping with a broom so he's alone <laughs> but we have on this side is full safety gear as you can see that's what that's our new Dutch intern is the one with the uh, sleeveless her name is Iris and she's a shipbuilding intern from the Netherlands and that's my co-founder Links there so he's a lumberjack and sawyer so he's teaching them all about the last and mm -hmm. So that was pretty much the talk on wood. So did you have further questions? So what do you use for spars and masts? Yeah, we're going to be looking for all the lower spars and larger uh, diameter pieces. We'll be going for Douglas fir. Or there's the type of spruce as well from the Haida Gwaii area. Sitka spruce, exactly, thank you. So we're going to get that. Um, they have a permit to go into the woods and selectively cut forestry management style, so we'll be using that. For very smaller spires, such as like um, study sale stuff, or you know, we, we may even have sweeps, ores, we're going to be using the Honduran cypress, which is not native but it's to Costa Rica, but it's planted all over. And it's a cypress, it's kind of like, it's also called cedar of Goa. So we're going to experiment with that for smaller diameter spires that we can risk it to break. But yeah, that's what it'll be for spires for now. Were there any other questions right now about wood, lumber, how we source it, our environmental practices about that? Okay. So, 
where, where are we actually talking about? So for some people who have actually been to Costa Rica, they might know about this, but it's a town of about 10 people, so I'm assuming you won't. <laughs> um, this is Punta Morales, or the moral point <laughs> of Costa Rica. And it's a small fishing town, close, or it's a small fishing village close to the town of Costa Pajaros, which is the bird coast. And it's about 45 minutes drive, unless it's snowing, <laughs> north of Punta Reynas. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is our little area. There's the fishing town, Costa Pajaros, I recently learned is the poorest region in the entire country. And it's interesting because it used to be an affluent fishing village, but because Costa Rica is such an environmentally conscious, tourist, eco-tourism oriented country, they actually said, look, we're going to be ha having higher standards for environmentalism. We don't want you to fish as much. We want to cut that back, make it more sustainable. And everyone in the world said, yes, good, Costa Rica is the leader in environmental standards. However, they didn't take any care of the fishermen. They just took away their jobs. So we have a whole fishing village that's not really allowed to fish. There are six, 60 fishermen families there that are allowed to fish artisanally, so in very small boats like this big. But the, the area is, it's interesting. It doesn't seem poor, but all the houses are for sale, every single house. And there's things because it was very recent. But it means that we have a lot of people coming up on bicycles, walking, trucks, motorcycles, asking for jobs every day. So it's very nice to know that we're in a location that wants us there. But yeah, so on the top of this picture, you can see Playa Blanca, which is White Beach. It's the nicest beach in the whole area. Everyone tells us that. And on the other side of the beach, you can see the National University Campus for Marine Science, which is kind of nice as our neighbor. And at the end of the point, you can see the sugar factory. So this is the number one only point in the country where sugar and molasses and uh, ethanol the product of that, are exported. So you can see the big freighter right there. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic of the place we are in. And we are circled there. And we have 1.4 hectares. We're circled in the bottom left. I'm not sure if you can see it, mm -hmm. the circle. But we are on 1.4 hectares, or 3.5 acres, of usable land. And we have all the build permits for that. And it has three-phase power, paved roads, everything right there. We do have to thank the sugar sugar mill for that and yeah you can see actually here there's a small channel so this photo was taken may last year at the height of dry season uh, so it was the lowest low tide right after the full moon at the lowest low tide at the height of dry season we took a drone and took these photos so that we could see the riverbed and what was really going on in our area all exposed this is the lowest low water that we can expect. And the channel is still about one and a half meters deep. We are planning to sound everything soon and do a whole 3D modeling. But there is about 3.5 meters of tide there um, on average, and it does get a lot higher. So, yeah, it's our land. This is a photo taken a couple months ago. <laughs> this was a really popular photo, but to me it looks a little bit ramshackle. But this is a, we're building our wood shop there, and you can see the palm trees and the beautiful land we have, but it's also very flat, usable ground. Now we have a full wood shop. This is all walled in with screen, and there's power and everything, and workbenches, and yeah, the roof is real. <laughs> there's not just a dippy roof, it's all totally roofed in. And I have to give credit, I thought he was going to be here today, but Colin Burt was down there helping us put the roof up at the shipyard, so it would have been really nice <laughs> if Captain Colin Burt was here, he's got his Pathfinder shirt on. But uh, this is one of our teams there, they put the roof up. So yeah, um, there's another shot, you can see now that it's a bit more sturdy, a lot more roof going on, there's our work truck there. And just setting up, that's cutting the keel. This was also taken about two days ago. I tried to get some recent photos. And here's a closer view of that. Cutting the keel, this is with one of the other Dutch interns. We have two. Um, so that's our Alaskan sawmill. That bar is 120 centimeters long. So it's over a meter wide. And that's what they're cutting right now. That's the really, really hard wood that you can't cut with carbide blades. 
And you can see that that elastic ensemble is completely maxed out to the centimeter. <laughs> so that's kind of exciting for us. That's the keel piece. So we'll have three of those trees to make up the keel. Um, yeah. Oh, I don't know if anyone knows, from the West Coast we did another promotional tour and that was, uh, we had a good time in the North Star of Pershall Island, which is a nice little fully rigged ship. It's tiny on the East Coast, on the West Coast, so that's assured. So what's our recent work down there? We've been doing a lot to get the keel foundation ready. So you can see these posts are actually forgotten branches or discarded branches of the trees we cut down. That, that was that jungle photo. Um, but we don't want to waste anything. So we collected all those trees or the branches and said, yes, we will use those. Um, so that's those Spanish cedar posts. And then across the top of three of them, there will be a keel block, which will disperse the weight. And then on top of those keel blocks, we'll actually start building the ship with the keel that you saw being cut in the previous photo. So yeah, and in the distance you can just see a tiny bit of water, and this is the aerial view of that. So this is what our shipyard really looks like. This is the same day taken, the same photo, photo taken on the same day as that previous aerial shot. So you can see it's the height of dry season. And any tree that looks dead, it's actually not. I, I swear, two days after this, we had the drone guy come. It rained for the first time in months, and everything burst into yellow flowers. All the trees were yellow flowers. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my pictures look like all the trees are dead. <laughs> but they are very much alive. So, yeah. I might walk over and just point some things out. <laughs> so... This is obviously the ship. <laughs> is this okay? This is obviously the ship, with those dots being the post I showed you in the slide before. We're going to be building this hangar and this lofting floor when I get back. We just received a little bit of funding for that, so we're finally able to move forward. We have all the design and 3D renderings, technical drawings, build permits, we have everything. So we have to be really um, on top of making sure we've checked every box off. So, because at Costa Rica, you think Central America, you can get away with anything. No, they call it the Switzerland of Central America. They love permits. <laughs> so, we have to make sure everything is checked off with that, but it is, so we're finally ready to move forward. This was the crazy wood shop that I just showed you. So that's actually completed now. This is my office. This is tree, two tree houses. Um, these tree houses are incredible, they're up in the tree, and they're built with donated <coughs> materials, and they have Wi-Fi and everything. <laughs> these are two yurts that we brought in. These yurts also have Wi-Fi, but they, I essentially live in a tent. So our, can, our crew tent quite a bit, but it's, it has hardwood floors, so I don't complain too much. This is a, like, waterworks facility. So it's our laundry, our shower, our washrooms, our everything, and that has solar power, heated water, and it has a dry composting toilet, so we keep it pretty eco-friendly down there. <laughs> um, and up there is a new crew barracks we just built, and so if you guys follow us on social media, you'll get to see how, how crazy some of our buildings look, but they're all donated materials, so it's pretty fun. We get away with having some very fun buildings on the site, but it's because it's all temporary. So we have a five-year lease with the option to buy and the option to extend. But basically, we're building buildings that will last five years, that are environmentally friendly, quick, cheap, because our focus is on building the boat. So. So this is this is the part that people think, okay, so you can build a boat, but how are you going to put it in the water? <laughs> we actually have a lot of people come down, and people who've never been on a boat before, this is their top question. And I look at them like, do you really know much about boats anyway? Like, they're like, I don't believe you can do it. <laughs> this is our plan. So that's the lofting floor where we're going to draw out the templates. And the bigger part is the actual shipbuilding hangar. 
And that's the boat, Seba. We're going to launch her bow first because it is quite shallow and we wouldn't want the rudder to get jammed on anything. So normally it is a stern launch first, but we're doing bow. I'm sure people will <laughs> have discussion points. We're not sure exactly how we're going to launch it, whether she'll pull herself out with her own power and winches, or if we have a tugboat off, or what we're really going to do. But we've walked the land with one guy who did this design for us, and we've also surveyed the land with a shipwright, Mr. Pat Woodland, who built the Pacific Swift. Um, so we've had a couple of professionals with us looking at it there, and they've all said, yeah, of course you can do this. The details will work out. But we also need to get another permit for that, which will be about $15,000, just for the permit. Yeah, we've been here in U.S. Everything I say is actually in U.S. dollars. Um, we've been guaranteed that it should be doable, and we've had an environmental permit guy who's on our team come and look at it, and we've had the municipal inspector come look at it. They've all said we can make it work. So, yeah. So this is the boat I mentioned from before, and I said I'm going to circle back. This is the Ruth, flagship of Barbados, my first day as captain. Well, this was actually my first day as captain on any boat ever. <laughs> so this is the launch. Um, maybe some of you guys have seen it. It was kind of exciting. But that boat is 32 meters on deck, and we will be 38 meters on deck, I think. So we're a little bit bigger, but it will be quite similar. So I was on board for that, and I wrote the launch method statement for that, which was, I think, about 12 pages and included the Coast Guard, um, the police, the, like, I mean, every single aspect of that country was there. They had the largest tugboat, the largest crane, and actually the Prime Minister himself was there, and the ministers from other neighboring islands were there, and it was ridiculous, but it worked. <laughs> so we did it once, we'll do it again. Is that another wooden ship? No, nope, that's a steel boat. Yeah, there's definitely going to be some differences in how we do it, but the premise is the same, put the boat in the water. Yeah, so are there any other questions about this? Yes, it is. So this boat is Barbadian, or Bajan, as they say, um, but the owner is actually from Montreal. His whole family is from Barbados, but he grew up in Montreal. And he loves it. There's even a McGill flag flying. You can't see it, but he's very, <laughs> he loves it. <laughs> so, and you can see the big bulldozer there uh, under the bow, kind of. And there's a, the largest tugboat in the country was over here. So, it was an exciting day, but it went very well. Are there questions about the launch or anything so far? So, for this part, I, was, I don't like to dwell too much on this part because it's kind of negative and we all hear every day about environmental impacts of everything we do. But So what I'm going to do is just show you one of the two slides that we shared at the United Nations Conference on Climate Change when we presented. They said you have three minutes and you can give two slides. So, this is one of them. And basically along the top you can see all different things such as fuel spills, acoustic pollution, oil drilling. I mean, the shipping industry transports 90% of everything that we touch. So if you think, well, boats don't affect me or something, 90% of every single thing in this room and every, everything has been on a ship. So it's very big. And ships operate outside of territorial waters, but climate change has no borders. Uh, that basically means that they don't have to adhere to international standards when they're in, in international waters. So the International Maritime Organization has openly stated we know that they burn uh, the dirty excess fuel, the sludge. We know that they burn them on, on open barrels on the deck, but there's nothing we can do. So we're just trying to ra ra raise some awareness about that. This is something I could get into. It's a whole presentation in itself, but we're going to move forward. Oh, one little point that some people don't notice or don't realize is that shipping companies actually own and operate many, many oil drilling platforms. So they use so much crude oil that it's in their best interest to own their own oil platforms. And so when you hear about spills such as the Deepwater Horizon that had the most, it was the worst oil spill in US history, that was actually, uh, or oil rigs such as that are actually owned by shipping companies so they can fuel themselves. Um, just so think about that when you hear about any oil rig, oil spill, it's also directly related to the shipping companies. So, yeah, 
and the basic question is whenever you have your organic fair trade, you know, coffee in a biodegradable cup and you know, solar powered lights in the shop and everything about it is good, that coffee was still transported on a boat like this. So it's the missing link. Again, dun dun dun. Moving on. So this is one of our, I'm getting to the end of the presentation, but this is our, now to pick up things. Oops. The exciting part, our cargo. So we aim to have uh, organic cargoes and everything like that, but people always ask us, what if something like a tire company or Coca-Cola wanted to ship with you? Would you say yes? My answer is yes. I would ship with them because we want to make an example and we want to show that shipping can be done clean. So we would like to have products like this and so far we have many letters of intent of people who want to ship with us like this. Um, but basically I just want to see shipping change for all products. But yeah, these are the people we have so far. And to answer your question from before, these are the type of things we can take. Um, so we can take barrels, boxes, pallets, aeronautical containers that go on planes. We can do loose cargo, anything except for the standard container, which actually can work in our benefit because some things are longer than 40 feet and they can't get shipped normally. So we can ship them, such as long pieces of lumber. Those are just a couple quotes from people who will be shipping with us and have signed letters of intent for shipping in chocolate and coffee. Um, basically, this is a reinvestment system, so our investors can choose to give some of their future dividends back to the producers. Some people actually do choose to give 100% back, um, so that we would give them to our cargo partners, such as small coffee producers in Costa Rica. And yeah, basically my last slide, or one of my last slides is how is this project funded? And we are actually funded, it's kind of interesting, we're funded entirely by people who want to become ship owners. So we sell shares in the ship, and people can step up and just like investing in any other company, you would get return on investment, and we have a whole booklet. Um, but we have people, we have 48 investors from all over the world, and they're ship owners, and yeah, I'm sure they can't wait to sail on their boat one day. So I'll go back to this slide, but I'm closing out now. And these are just other sailing cargo vessels that I've worked on that, that we're also partners, that in partnership with, so just underlying that we're not the only boat out there, but we will be the largest, and the only one with an electric engine. So these guys are also worth celebrating. The end. <laughs> Are there any comments or questions? Yes. Will it carry passengers along with freight? So the question was, will it carry passengers along with freight? The short answer is no, but the long answer is yes. <laughs> so we will take 12 crew, 12 professional crew, some of which may be volunteers, and we have space for up to 12 passengers or trainees. So in general, we're not offering to passengers, but to investors, or possibly to scientists, or journalists, or people that have some connection to the boat, there will be spaces for them. Uh, what about time frame? How, how soon do you think you can get this done? <laughs> so the question is on uh, timeline and schedule. The estimate we have is 3.5 years from now, basically. So it's 3.5 years from when the keel is laid, and while well, the keel is getting cut, so I guess the time should start ticking. So <laughs> you're funding mostly, the funding for building the ships. Yep. Yeah, so we, the funding is estimated to cost 3.6 million dollars, and so far we've gotten about 180 thousand dollars U.S. invested, just people investing in shares. Um, but we actually say that we have about just under $700,000 is checked off um, because a lot of that money will be paid to our professionals, workers such as me, in the form of shares. So that's not money we actually have to make. And that's a proven method that's been worked that the other vessels that you saw, that's what they do. So for example, I'm a shareholder in the Avon Tour uh, because I did their reading and I got basically no pay for it, but now I have shares in their company. So. 
we're about 17% funded of the total that we need. Yeah, I'm so impressed with this whole vision and what you're doing. And my question is, this mission statement didn't happen overnight. It must have taken a, a period of time, numbers of people, how you got together, how it all gelled into what you are now on your path to success. I yeah. mean, how many, and, 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 and you seem very young to have been involved with this pro process, but I compliment you for it, and I think it's very, very exciting. Thank you so much, it's very fun. Yes, this, well I've been sailing, people do say sometimes that I'm quite young, and but I have been sailing tall ships since I was 13, and I tried university for one year, but ran back to the sea. So this, is, <laughs> this has really been my very, very focused direction for pretty much almost my whole life. Um, there is a huge team behind this, and it's because it's not an entirely new idea. There are other boats, like that last slide I showed you, that are doing very, very, very similar projects that have inspired many people, but they're extremely romantic. They don't have the business sense behind their models to be financially viable. And basically that just means that they end up looking like a bunch of cowboys because their boats are smaller and they're not run very well. But they really started it. They really inspired everybody. So we basically are a group of people, I represent a number of people, um, who all sailed on those other cargo sailing boats and said, this is awesome, but we want to do better. So we took what we learned from them, and most of them are our very close friends, all of them are, and they advise us, because they say, look, we started this and it's been great, but it needs to be done better. And we all learn from them. So we've taken a lot of lessons from them, and they're very supportive of us. Thank you. Um, um, you seem to have people from many countries in the world. Uh, are you actively fundraising in all these different countries? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How are you doing? <laughs> Well, um, this is what I tell everybody who asks this question, is that we have a 5% commission. <laughs> so anybody who wants to help sell shares, they either get shares in the company as well or cash back. But we try to be um, very international. And one way I do that is by getting magazine articles in all different languages. So we've been published so far in, well, in American and Canadian and British, but then in French and Spanish and Dutch uh, magazines already, and we're hoping to be in German, Danish, and Italian later this year in print, let alone many different languages online. Um, just to get the word out, because this is a global issue. But I just want to raise one little point here, is that although we are quite international, we try to only bring in volunteers from around the world, or paid skilled professionals that are not from Costa Rica, like that they don't offer that. And we do try to maintain 50% Costa Rican people on our team, and we always pay them. Uh, even, if, even if a volunteer could come in and dig that hole, we try to have 50% Costa Ricans and we pay them for their work. Uh, and when, whenever possible, we have obviously professionals in their capacity from Costa Rica as well. But basically it ends up we have a very strong Costa Rican office team and they don't really want to dig holes. <laughs> They're like, you have volunteers for that from Europe. <laughs> so. Do you pay your credentials? No, we do not. Did you hear the question? Do we, oh, do we pay our apprentices? No, we do not. Um, but we house them and we feed them, and if they're with us for longer term, we'll give them shares in the company. Um, and if they come to us and say that they need money for something or this or that, we, we take care of them. Um, so, but we don't pay them a wage. Diane, is there any way, she must have a website with the information of all what is happening that, that you as Skipper could send out to our members, even to other yacht clubs. It's on the brochure. It's on the brochure. It's on the brochure. It's on the It's on the bar. And in a way, it costs $7. So don't take one unless you really need it. Um, but it, um, 
You said it's online as well. This booklet is also available online on our website. So you may want to take a look at one. Oh, we can we buy these for seven? Those you can keep, yes. Yeah. Okay. And there must be a website on that. Yeah, yeah so we're active. We are active on all social media platforms, and we have a website. The little fold, the one-page folder that you're holding, please take that. That's free and for you. But we have a 48-page full-color comprehensive business plan at the back. If you really want one, you can please take it. Um, but I just wanted to tell people that they do cost us a bit of money, so please don't take five <laughs> unless unless you really want to. But. Please keep these. We also have stickers. Unless you've got somebody who is really willing to invest, and you know that they will drop some dollars in. That's exactly what I meant. Unless you're going to invest, or you know someone who wants to invest, then take all the books. <laughs> uh, back there. Oh, uh, one of the things you have not mentioned is what is your minimum investment? So our minimum investment is $100 US. So that's actually quite low. But it goes up in multiples of 100, but the next level tiers are 1,000, 5,000, and $20,000. And we have a lot of different benefits and incentives that go along with each level. So the payload on this is 200 tons. If someone's shipping 200 tons of coffee, say, on this vessel versus a conventional container ship, what's the difference, what's the difference in cost to the ship? Great question. So the question is basically how does our price compare with standard shipping? Um, and I'll just say that we do carry about 200 tons, however we carry 350 cubic meters. Um, and the difference being coffee, which is your example, which is one of our top cargos, is about-ish 2 cubic meters per ton. So that just means that we can take a full hold of actually 350 cubic meters. Basically, we did the math on it, and if you want to take one kilo of coffee, like one bag of coffee, from Costa Rica to Vancouver, it'll cost you, I think it was 60, 60 to 70 cents more per kilo. It works out to you, so when you look at the shipping cost, it is more expensive. So compared to one cent per ton mile, which is the cheapest, 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 we will be 20 cents per ton mile, so 20 times more expensive. However, we're actually much cheaper than trucking, and we're much cheaper than air freight. And back to that 60 to 70 cents more per kilo, we interviewed people when we were in Vancouver, which is one of our main places, and said, would you pay that? And people, actually, we interviewed roasters, distributors, and people like you, and they said, not only would we pay it, we wouldn't even ask. <laughs> Because they're already buying a niche product that's already value added. Have you done the math for the all in cost? In other words, the cost of restoring the, the oil spills and the, the environmental cost, you could then compare that to your all in cost for your vessel. <coughs> so the question is have we compared the all inclusive, I guess you could say, cost of detrimental types of shipping, like including oil spills? Um, compared to ours, and we have not. It would be a huge undertaking, but we actually do have a English boat builder who's living in Switzerland, and I think he's feeling a bit stuck because Switzerland is landlocked. Um, he's also an academic, and he's writing a paper on that, which will be shared with us, and we're working with him on that, to be able to look at the whole so-called cradle-to-grave cost of shipping. Yes, Jim. Do you plan on offering stock? Absolutely, we plan on offering stock. Be online listed? No. So we are not a publicly listed company. Uh, we are private. You would have to, you have to have a net worth of a couple million dollars <coughs> already to be publicly listed, like something like Google. Um, and we screen every single investor. So I either have met every single investor, or I have spoken with them on the phone, or I've looked them up and I have all their information. <laughs> because it's a small company, we need to make sure that the money that's coming in is clean and trustworthy. So they're not going to say the next day I need that money back. A lot of money. Because we won't have it. We will have spent it on wood. So until the boat is sailing and we make that money back, we need people to leave the money in our company until we actually have profits. And all of this, uh, we actually have. Available 25-year 
return on investment and expenses and balances sheet uh, available if you ask me. And at the back in that book, which is also available online, is a six-year projections. Uh, and we also have for the budget of the ship, which again is $3.6 million, we have a five-page budget that we've written up and it's been reviewed several times by different third parties to take a look at that. So, yeah. is, uh, is that one of the official permits you have to get, the staff? So the question is regarding the emboss on the front of that little flyer. That's not an official permit, that's our official company logo, and I'm so irked because I picked these beautiful books up uh, about one hour before flying, <laughs> and I didn't have time to hand emboss each one, but I'm glad you guys get to see those hand emboss flyers. <laughs> wow. Well, I echo what Liz said. I am totally impressed with what you're doing, and I wish you the best of luck. And are you going to build a second ship once this one starts? Let's get the first one built first. <laughs> well, do you want an answer? Yeah. <laughs> the question is about a second ship. We actually have a program in place right now that's being, it's actually uh, an architect's, naval architect student's thesis, and it's to build smaller boats, which are six, 45 to 80 feet, so a range, but 45 to 80 feet on deck, wooden, very simple wooden cargo schooners which would be built in our area which I mentioned was quite poor and the fishing has been a bit taken out. Uh, so it would be to give the people in the area local cargo options for their own products. So on this land we could build two other 40 to 80 foot or three boats simultaneously and we're working on that right now with the design with this architect. Very exciting. The last question then, Phil. What, what sort of products are you uh, currently uh, tra transporting in your, in your, your fleet? So that's an interesting question because we currently do not really have boat sailing, but we are working with a network of two different boats right now that will begin sailing in about two months <coughs> from now. Uh, they're about 80 feet on deck and they'll be selling coffee and chocolate, chocolate beans, like the raw product, which is called cacao, and um, organic bioplastics made of avocado seed. So we're going to, yeah, in Monteverde, in Costa Rica, where we lived for a long time, or a little while, <laughs> they just made plastic packaging and everything. It's a bylaw for that area, but they made it illegal. So we're going to be bringing in specialty bioplastics from Mexico, that you, Mexico has a huge avocado uh, plantation that's one of their biggest exports, and they're using the old pits to make incredible bioplastics. And we're bringing in samples in about two months from now to Costa Rica. Can you so, make water bottles out of avocado yeah, pits? <laughs> that would be a good idea. So last question then is, um, it's just gone very right. oh. Um, do you take visitors? We do take visitors. So anyone who wants to come visit us at the shipyard, we would love to have you. You can either camp with us in tents, or right across the road there's an air-conditioned little cabina with a pool. <laughs> it's really small, but just let me know beforehand if you want. We'll rent you a room there, and uh, come visit us. It's beautiful. We have the white beach right there. That's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Congratulations on the progress of what you're doing. Keep up the good work. Um, I'm 100% behind you. And here's a little token of our appreciation. So, not quite your ship, but a tall ship. Yes. Thank you. Let's just give her such a big round of applause. Thank you. Coming up next week, we have Brian Gooderham, and he will have a conversation with us about 100 years of sailing on Lake Ontario. So he's looking at, um, basically, the Gooderham legacy. And on February 21st, by the way, next week is Valentine's Day, on February 21st, Judy Munden will speak of her experiences as a blind sailor in her presentation, Catch the Wind, Feel the Freedom. 
She's totally enthusiastic. She spoke at Hamilton Showbacks, and Zah said she's amazing. So with that, I'm sorry.